Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. It is one of the nation's preeminent prosecutor's office with a long tradition of excellence in nonpartisanship. It has been led by prosecutorial legends, Tom Dewey, Frank Hogan, and Robert Morgenthau. Today, under Cyrus Vance, the office faces a shift in how modern crime works. Cybercrime, sex trafficking, money laundering, official corruption, conviction, integrity. Man, that's a job. New York County DA Cyrus Vance is with us today to talk about modern crime and law enforcement's responses. Mr. Vance became District Attorney of New York County on January 1st, 2010. He began his legal career in the Manhattan DA's office during the high crime era of the 1980s. Mr. Vance left the DA's office for Seattle, where he co-founded a prestigious law firm. In 2004, he returned to New York and partnered in another well-known and influential law firm. He is a fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers, and in 2011, he was selected by his peers to serve as the president of the District Attorney's Association of the State of New York. Welcome, Mr. DA. Professor, good to be here. I have a bone to pick with you. Thank Your you. website has Manhattan DA. You are not the Manhattan DA. Come on. Fess up. You're supposed to be truth, justice, and the American way. You lie. Well, we, I am the New York County District Attorney. Thank you. And uh, for some reason, it has always been a lot easier to just explain to people that you're the Manhattan DA. And so over time, colloquially, that's how we refer to the office. But you're absolutely right. There are five counties. New York County is Manhattan. They coexist and I'm the New York County DA. But you're, you're a state official. Exactly. You are not a city official. A, but, but it's odd that you get elected in the same cycle as municipal officers do. I, I don't know how that started, and, uh, and yet our cycle is in the mayoral cycle. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Let's start with cybercrime and cyber theft and, and, and identity theft, which I found to be really fundamentally the most interesting thing you do. You've been quoted as saying that this is not just a trend, but a fundamental shift in the way modern crime works. What do you, this is a new game? Well, it's a game that's evolved. When I was prosecuting cases in the 1980s uh, as a young assistant DA, obviously uh, cell phones weren't even in existence right. as far as I can remember. Uh, the computers were all IBM. Uh, PCs, if you could figure out how to use it. And the floppy disks right. were floppy uh, disks. It, but uh, crime has changed radically, and I think the biggest change that we've seen is the uh, impact of cyberspace on both committing crimes and proving cases against criminals. I used to think, and you probably would think in the old days, a crime scene is when a you know, car rolls up, street corner, yellow tape. Law and order, come yeah. on. The truth is the internet is the 21st century crime scene. Every single case virtually that we make, uh, whether, it, let me give you an example. Go ahead. Uh, about a month ago or so, we took down a, a large gang operation in East Harlem, 63 right. defendants. Right. That case was principally made by uh, access to Facebook uh, and the communications between alleged gang members before criminal events, after criminal events, uh, bragging uh, and the like as described in the indictment. Does that blow your mind that they're bragging on, on social uh, media? Well, I think it's, uh, not really. Go ahead. It, it's, that's an example. So, so in order to make a case against gang uh, uh, members or alleged gang members, uh, we are e using the internet mm -hmm. as our investigative vehicle. Uh, equally true, you're going to find in homicide cases and domestic violence cases, uh, the critical evidence is also is, is often and also going to be text messages between the players mm. uh, before and after. Uh, and then on the other side, you're obviously seeing a, a huge wave of crimes being committed through the Internet. Identity theft is the mm -hmm. fastest growing crime in New York County. 
Uh, I'd say and it's a big part of your caseload? Uh, we have about, th we have two kinds of cases. Uh, we opened up a cybercrime bureau in 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, we now actually have our own cyber lab uh, because the volume of electronic equipment that we are now asked to evaluate in order to understand what the evidence is mm -hmm. is so great that the PD can't keep up with us. Uh, so we opened up our own lab, funded with some help from significant help from the city council, mm -hmm. and we provide training for law enforcement around the state. Uh, wow! And so uh, the we have about probably two to three hundred new cases that come in by way of street arrests by the NYPD. Someone picked up with a credit card or, or some other identity theft type crime. Uh, and we also have long-term investigations. We've chased down uh, identity thieves in Belarus, the Ukraine. We had a conviction last week, a uh, case that's three years old against uh, folks who were in, in involved with identity theft internationally. It's a, it's a huge problem. So, Doug, if you're asking me where's sort of the bet for the future, uh, the bet for the future for uh, a, a major metropolitan prosecutors like ours is we have to be competent in cybercrime because whether it's economic crime, street crime, sex crime, international money laundering. It all has the nexus. It though. all has the nexus of the computers. Wow. Okay. Talk about your office. Just briefly describe the, the size, the scope, the various bureaus. I was astounded at the breadth of it's, what it's, you guys It's do. unlike any Let's other prosecutor's go. office in the country. Number one, you've talked about some of my predecessors, sort of a, an extremely uh, distinguished group of DAs uh, who preceded me, and I was privileged to be able to follow. Uh, before I got elected, there had been three DAs in 75 years. So that tells you a little bit something about the, you know, the, the office nonpartisanship, sort of a straight ahead, mm -hmm. uh, no fear nor favor uh, approach. But today, uh, we are a huge office, 535 lawyers. We handle about 100,000 cases a year. To give you a point of comparison, that is more criminal cases in a year that we handle than the entire United States Department of Justice handles nationwide. Wow. So the volume is extraordinary. The breadth of cases is also extraordinary from cybercrime to homicide, from marijuana possession to interruption of terrorist financing. No other office wow. literally Exciting. does what we do. It's a great office. Uh, and I think uh, my challenge uh, taking over uh, from my predecessor was uh, really to make sure that I, the, the platform that I inherited, the great office that I inherited, mm -hmm. that we continue to innovate uh, and we continue to collaborate in order to be more effective in crime fighting. And by innovating, cybercrime is one of those examples where we, you know, it is what we have to deal with for the future. So the office needs to be competent uh, in the cyber arena. Now we partner with Secret Service, ICE, FBI on many, many cybercrime cases. Uh, we opened up a financial intelligence unit in our office formally about a month ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we are, you know, uh, we, uh, we have 20 analysts who are now evaluating FinCEN data, uh, open source data. Uh, toward what end? Toward uh, trying to track money movements and investigate money movements that are suspicious in the hope that we may uncover crime as a result of it. What are suspicious money movements? So, for example, uh, suspicious money movements, if you have uh, someone who is moving, uh, you know, who is moving cash, let's say someone is uh, out buying uh, luxury cars and they're buying, you know, 25,000 or 30,000 or 50,000 in cash, uh, forms should be filed by the car dealer uh, saying this guy just came in and right. put 25, 35,000 dollars down. Now that may be an example of money laundering. Right. And so that's an example of how we are, have access to these, uh, uh, you know, these forms that are you know, accessible because we are a law enforcement agency right. and it helps us investigate. Typically, these kinds of business crime investigations have remained in the white collar arena. But the point of the financial intelligence unit is also to make our whole trial division, street crime prosecutors, yep. understand that you know, their cases can become better, uh, stronger, if they become more sophisticated in evaluating uh, a uh, drug gang by tracking proceeds. And they're willing, they're open to do this. Sometimes the old well, line pros sir, well, sir, get wedded to their uh, own uh, uh, SOPs. Uh, sure, but at the end of the day, I think it works. It's, it's my job to uh, make sure that as times change, the office changes and juries, you know, juries uh, expect more in criminal cases today. 
they they know about DNA. Uh, they know about money movement. Mm -hmm. If there are unanswered questions, jurors want them anticipated in answers if they can be. And ultimately, this is all to the you know to, to the effect of making our cases stronger. How do you relate to your this bureaucracy with these major divisions? I mean. In the sense, what's your leadership style or management style, if there is such a thing? I, I started, first of all, as a trial lawyer. Right. So I've spent my entire life uh, as a lawyer in the courtroom. And so I think, number one, I approach the office as someone who is very interested in the details. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in the cases. Uh, I meet frequently with assistants in the office to talk about cases either in which I have an interest or in which they think I should be uh, mm -hmm. involved in the decision making. I don't typically tell them what to do. Mm -hmm. I typically am trying to understand what we are doing and why, and then... Yeah, because they're the experts. Uh, and, and, and where there's a disagreement, we, we hash it right. out. Uh, I think that uh, ultimately I have, I'm blessed with you know, a large amount of very experienced folks. Uh, and my job, I think, is to understand, uh, you know, is to set direction, uh, set policy. Uh, give them the resources, and ultimately make judgment calls on those cases where the DA has to make the judgment call. Okay. You delivered remarks at a, uh, a conference at the City Bar Association in June 2012 called The Conscience and Culture of a Prosecutor. Conscience? Come on. Should you have a... Do you have a conscience, and should you have a conscience? Well, of course... Prosecutors should, and I believe do, uh, absolutely care deeply about the fundamental issues that underpin our criminal justice system, fairness uh, and integrity. Most people don't go into the business of prosecution for the money. Most of my assistants or the assistants in our office have decided, decided to stay there because they mm. love the work. Uh, and they love the work because they believe they have a positive impact on the community that they serve uh, in the work that they do. Sure. Uh, when I talk about the conscience and culture of a prosecutor's office, uh, you know, it is my direction to them, and I think it is the underpinning of the office that I am uh, not interested in, uh, you know, in racking up convictions. Uh, I'm interested in making sure that the assistants in our office exercise judgment in every case that they handle, mm -hmm. and whether that's to prosecute vigorously, to dismiss because we lack evidence, right. or, to, or to strike a fair plea bargain. So uh, the office has, a, I think, a, a history, uh, going back, I think, uh, as you may recall, to the, those remarks, Tom Hogan, sure. uh, D.A. Hogan, in the wiley Hofford case. Right. But certainly, it, our office has, has, uh, has been involved with a number of reinvestigations of high-profile cases. I think we try uh, very hard to make sure that in our training and on our case analysis, we, we get it right. Um, I opened up a conviction integrity unit within the office early in my tenure in 2010. One of the very first one in of the, the very state. First, one of the very first in, in the, the country. country. And uh, I had been a defense lawyer for 20 years. And so I had represented people accused of crime around the country. And I understood that there were a couple of things going on. Number one, uh, DNA exonerations had called the entire justice system to focus upon our practice and procedures, particularly as they pertain to identifications, confessions, use of informants, handling of evidence and the like. So what I wanted to do was to make sure that this superb modern prosecutor's office essentially had a, uh, the equivalence of a compliance program so that our, our prosecutors would have a better understanding in training how to evaluate certain kinds of cases where we knew uh, conviction integrity had been implicated around the country mm -hmm. in the list that I just gave okay. you. Secondly, it's a, so on the front end, uh, it's a more robust anal analysis. Uh, and on the back and end... And that's preventative. I mean, preventative. you know, prevent wrongful charging decisions and, and convictions. The goal, for example, of, of uh, making sure that if we are looking at a one witness ID case, that the office uh, has a checklist for young assistants to review when they start in on one of these cases, make sure they're asking all the right questions. In many bureaus, before a case is charged or indicted, uh, uh, it will be roundtabled by senior prosecutors. Mm -hmm. Things that are just sort of common sense. Uh -huh. So, th but then there's the back end. So you've got the front end and you've got the back end, and that's reviewing And that's reviewing cases where... And that seems to be more and more prevalent among DA's offices, and in fact... 
lots of cases of exoneration, particularly around DNA. But you've noted, and you noted in your testimony, that there were cases where DNA wouldn't have been dispositive. DNA has not been dispositive in the cases that have been, in, that we've reevaluated. Uh-huh. Uh, and so, the, it really what it boils down to is we you know, listen to and review the presentation by either defense lawyer, the defendant, or whomever brings it in. We have to make a judgment call, is this, you know, does this... What triggers it? I mean, what, what allows you to give it, you know, review? Well, I think there has to be a, uh, the, the papers and the presentation have to give us pause. Uh-huh. You know, a, 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 is there something that wasn't presented at the first trial uh, that should have been? This happened to you? Well, this, we've had several cases okay. that we have actually dismissed, uh, gone back and dismissed wow. since, since uh, uh, the initiation of the unit. And, uh, and so it's a, it's a very th systematic review of those cases that we take on. Does that in any way create friction among the, the ADAs because you're having other ADAs looking over your shoulder? Yes. But they're I, pros, but I yes? Th I think at the end of the day, um, it's human nature to uh, have a sense of ownership mm -hmm. in a case that you may have tried and convicted. On the other hand, I also think that we're professionals and, and we need to be dispassionate. And new evidence has come forward that was not available at the first trial that calls into question the integrity of the jury verdict. Uh, the assistants in our office who participated in this understand that I'm going to, you know, we're going to do the review and the chips will fall where they may. And this is, and this is endemic. I mean, there's the case, the, the, the current case in Brooklyn where uh, the, the cop, you know, there are 50 murder cases that are being questioned. I mean, that's the type of thing that clearly a very proactive system can begin to prevent. Right. Well, the goal is to have, you know, interesting, I think the most important part of this work and what I think makes our Conviction Integrity Unit different is the front end protocols. Yeah. Uh, this is ultimately where I think what you're trying to do is to make sure yep. that the culture of the office is one where people understand it's not about getting convictions, it's about getting it right. It's the DNA of the office. And I'm, that's right. And that was what motivated me as a young assistant. Uh, obviously we're competitive lawyers. Sure. Uh, you want to win cases, but you want to get it right. And, and what I say uh, often is that we have a lot of power uh, particularly young lawyers with a lot of power and along with that power has to come a sense of humility uh, that we do hope. we do uh, from time to time uh, uh, make errors in judgment and we have to listen and we have to be prepared to evaluate again but uh, I think this is a natural course of a, of a big prosecutor's office. Okay let's turn to something that really horrified me and in fact it was an op-ed piece that you did in the Daily News titled New York's brutal trade in human lives, the whole issue of human and sex trafficking. Talk about it in terms of sort of the macro, this brutal trade in human lives, and your responses, your offices, law enforcement's responses to this. Well, I think we've, it's a, it's a it is an evolution in um, how we look at uh, the prostitution arena mm -hmm. uh, and a increased recognition that m prostituted men and women, boys and girls, are more frequently than you would imagine in the trade because they are being abused and uh, It was awful. It, go so, ahead. So, so what we try to do now is, uh, is look at prostitution cases, each one individually, but if we see a case where what we really think we have is actually the prostituted man or woman being abused, coerced, uh, in any number of ways, either physically or otherwise, uh, we, we may and we have brought sex trafficking charges. We, we convicted a sex trafficker recently who was sentenced to 42 years. Right. We have a case on trial now I can't comment on because it's in front of the right, judge. Right, this is the George Sr. Yeah. and George Jr. Uh, uh, but, uh, bench trial. But we opened up our, our sex trafficking unit, I think, almost two years ago in recognition of the fact that um, there is a, you know, a, you know, a, 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 a abusive, uh, you know, a huge number of cases around the world that are out there involving physical abuse and coercion. A certain number of those cases are going to pass through Manhattan mm -hmm. and we're taking them seriously. Okay. Now,
Is there a, another approach that you're using, as well as treating the prostitutes as victims, is really going after the Johns? And does that work? What's the logic behind it? And does it, in a sense, work? And what does it mean to work? Well, I think the what we the advantage of an office like ours is we have very sophisticated economic crimes prosecutors and very experienced sex crimes prosecutors. Mm. You try to merge those in a sex trafficking investigation because it's a business. It's a business with typically people at the head of it, man or woman, uh, who are the business owners uh, and who manage the business. You then are they have, did both domestic and foreign? Domestic and foreign. You have supply. Those people who are supplying often uh, bringing women to locations. You have the prostituted men and women themselves, and then you have the supply. So it's supply and demand, excuse me. So you, if you're going to take on the, the business enterprise, you need to deal with supply okay. and demand. Uh, the Dealing with the Johns is a question of dealing with demand. Does it affect demand? Well, it's too early for me to say Go ahead. in terms of... Is there any evidence? Because this was tried in New York City a while ago in another jurisdiction. Well, in, 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 in that recent case, which is the, you know the last pieces of which are being tried now, there were a number of... Uh, uh, of men who were charged with prom with patronizing prostitutes, right. they resol they all resolved their cases, right. and I think that it does. The the point really is that uh, that's a case that obviously we believed involved sex trafficking. Right. And I think the point of charging those individuals was to make the statement that uh, there are individuals who are in the business of prostitution, uh, young men and women who may themselves be victims mm -hmm. of sex trafficking. And so that it is not, it's often portrayed as glamorous by some. Uh, and, you know, the Julia, Roberts, the Julia Roberts, uh, you know, film, sure. whatever that was, Pretty Girl, or right. I can't remember. Woman. Uh, pretty Woman. And, and so that, that, that there is a dark side to this that people need to be aware of uh, before they become uh, part of the demand side. One, one, one of the things that I want to touch on is your anti-gang activity, which yeah. you mentioned earlier. What is the extent, the location, the socio-demographics of gang activity in New York 2013? It's very different than it was 1980s uh, compared to today. What we see today in Manhattan, and I can't speak for the other boroughs, but is principally younger men, some women, principally younger men uh, and boys, you know, 14, 19 years old. And then there are some folks who are older than that but it is younger people. Uh, it is loose affiliations uh, with gangs. Uh, it's not hierarchical as much as folks who are gathered based upon a local turf and territory, often associated with a housing development. Right. And, and so we see uh, some gangs are motivated by selling drugs. Uh, in order to do that, they may be bringing guns in to manage the turf. Uh, some gangs are mo motivated not so much by money as just simply by protecting turf and, and fighting with each other. Right, and props. But, you know, the recent, yeah. the recent gang in East Harlem was not about, uh, was not about money. It was really about uh, old school just beefs yeah. between developments and shootings. So we opened up uh, something called the Crime Strategies Unit in 2010. It really was my, f I think it's a, a fundamental shift in a prosecutor's office that I think will have a long-term impact. Uh, I want the office the, to, to develop essentially an intelligence-based approach to uh, crime fighting. Uh, not so much just being reactive to police arrests, but rather being very proactive in understanding who's driving crime in each neighborhood, uh, identifying them in cooperation with the police and sometimes the community, sure. and dismantling the folks that are making the most disruption in our communities. Mm -hmm. uh, the Crime Strategies Unit helps me uh, by dividing the county up into five zones, uh, identify who the crime drivers are in each one, and then we have a targeted strategy to take those gangs out. We've taken out, I think, 11 or 13 gangs in two and a half years, wow. several hundred defendants, taken 500 plus guns off the streets out of those indictments alone, out of one unit of our office. That's 500 guns that can't be used to shoot and uh, shoot neighbors or, sh or point at cops. So it's been a very successful strategy. I think you know, Manhattan's, uh, Manhattan's uh, we have too many homicides still today, 
but our, you know, our shooting incidents and our homicide rates in Manhattan are declining in the last couple of years greater than other counties. I think this coordinated strategy with the NYPD is working. And some of that's got to do, though, with sociodemographics as well in terms of sort of the upscaling of Manhattan now. I, I, I don't, you would think you would have more white-collar criminals. We have, pl we have plenty of white-collar criminals, but... A I, lot. I don't think that... Uh, I don't think, actually, I don't think those declining numbers are the product of changed demographics. Okay. Uh, I, but I can't prove it. Yeah, okay. Uh, last thing, government corruption and the Public Trust Act. I right. mean, we, we could have spent the last half hour talking about government corruption and the role of prosecutors in uncovering it. You support this Public Trust Act. It, it hasn't been passed. It's, it, it, right now it's being log-rolled and negotiated. Talk about the act and why you support it. Well, in 2010, when I was elected, uh, I believed then uh, that New York's public corruption laws were outdated. Uh, the federal government and most other states have much more robust laws enabling prosecutors to get at public corruption. Our New York laws are outdated, and our successes in public corruption have been in spite of those laws, not because of them. Let me give you some examples. Go ahead. Uh, our laws related to bribery in the state court are outdated. Yep. Uh, you need, you know, you need both sides to have an agreement to bribe rather than if I'm intending to bribe you and I give 500 bucks, I ought to be guilty of attempting to bribe you. Uh, I want more than five. I'm uh, not cheap like these assemblies. Uh, and uh, it creates other statutes such as corrupt government corruption mm -hmm. statutes aimed at individuals who are defrauding the government. And it also deals with the issue of procedural uh, grand jury practice, uh -huh. transactional immunity, which is a big impediment to state prosecutors in getting witnesses into the grand jury without giving them immediate immunity as they get under the state system. So okay. it's overdue. Okay. They're giving me the goodbye sign, but I'm not ready to say goodbye. What's next? Well, 30, uh, uh, 10 seconds before they kill me. Uh, enhanced cybercrime prosecution, uh, uh, more collaboration, Family Justice Center opening this fall, uh, you're going to see more of the same uh, in terms of cyber focused street crime prosecution and, and uh, aggressive prevention around the county. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's doing more of what's been working. Excellent. My thanks to New York County District Attorney Cyrus Vance for being on the show. Join us next week when my guest will be John Straspa, who will talk about his new book, The Village. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.